Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father Abba, we come to you today, Lord, asking that you will open up your communication pathways and help us to understand your word and how we are to use it in our lives and become the children that you would have us to be in these tremendous times. In your son's name we pray, amen. Amen. And so be it. Hey, y'all. God stay with me. Shalom. And in today's class, we're going to be talking about the Shepherd of Hermas, Vision 3. Mm-hmm. Prayfully, this will be the first of a series that we'll do to complete Vision 3, just like we've done in Similitudes and in the commands of the book called The Shepherd of Hermas. We went down through and did a verse-by-verse -verse study covering every verse in that entire book with the exception of Vision 3, and so we plan to finish that up here right now. Yeah, this will be the last, um, I guess, chapter that we cover. Yeah, until we start over. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, what we want to do in this uh, class, like we said, we want to touch on every verse in Visions 3, but... We want to expound on it and basically spill our guts on everything we know about this book. Yeah, and um, I guess it's a good thing to continue to start over because you're always learning new stuff. This book is, um, I guess, so awesome that every time you read it, you discover new things. Yeah, um, we've actually been reading this book all the way back to the first time which was in 1998 and even to this day when we pick it up and read it it's I ain't gonna say it's like reading it for the first time but you do discover a lot of stuff that you missed the first 17 times that you read the book yeah and one of the things that we do want to do while we're doing this class is promote this book heavily we want by the time you finish this series and even go in and check out the other playlists that we've done that you have an overwhelming desire in your spirit to actually go read this book for yourself mm -hmm. and even maybe even consider following the instructions of this book and that is to teach it yeah I was thinking about that also to you know it'd be great to have um, like-minded people who's not only studying together but as well teaching together yeah, and this is the only book that I've read, other than the Great Commission in the book of Matthew, this is the only book that tells you to go out and teach the lessons that are in the book. Mm -hmm. Nowhere else in Exodus, nowhere else in the New Testament does it give you instructions to go and teach what you have just read, except in the, in the Shepherd of Hermas. It's actually a ministry inside of this book that tells you to go teach the book. And that's how actually Hermes Academy got started. Yeah, I would say that um, the topics that are covered in The Shepherd of Hermes not only are topics to help you with your um, um, life, life, yeah, yeah, your life as far as following the Father, but... Um, your day-to-day -day things that you're getting done, how to treat your children, how to treat your husband, how to love your wife, different things like that. So every everything seems to be covered within this one book. It is a very practical book. I will go as far as to say that this information in this book is necessary for anybody who plans to live through the tribulation and into the millennial age. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, anybody who's planning on flying away of course, they can do what they want. You know, they don't have to really, you know, work to change their lives as those people who plan to inherit the earth. They have to make all corrections before or during this tribulation or they won't be given the opportunity to even survive the tribulation and they won't make it into the kingdom age. They'll basically have to be recycled or born again to even see the kingdom age. Yeah, now's the time to start making that change. Um, you know, now's the time that we have, well, we have been given the time to start preparing. So, you know, 
go out and purchase the book. You can uh, find it on eBay where you can get it, you know, three or four dollars or, you know, sometimes it's even higher if you want a used book or you can purchase a new one at a very reasonable price. Um, or you could even just, you know, find a PDF or audio. A lot of people like to listen to it, and that's a good way of learning about it as well. Yeah, you can see there's several copies of what's called the Lost Books of the Bible and the Forgotten Books of Eden. But here we are looking at it on Target.com. This is the exact book that I have. It's called The Lost Books of the Bible and the Forgotten Books of Eden. And it has the Shepherd of Hermas in it. Amongst a lot of other different hidden books and forgotten books. And you see this is about $10.99. But like Stacy said, you know, if you want to find one used, you can find one for about 2 or $3 on eBay. But for this class, we're actually going to use a free PDF that you can download to your computer. I've come into Google and I've typed in the word the Shepherd of Hermes. And I'm also searching for the William Waite translation because that is the exact same translation that you find in the Lost Books of the Bible and the Forgotten Books of Eden. To me, that is the best translation. And if you come down to a website called en.wikisource.org, you'll find an article about the Shepherd of Hermas, but part way down in the web page, you'll find the actual text to the book. It's in three parts. You have Visions 1, Mandates, which is called Commands, and you have the Similitudes or the Parables. Those are three different books. We'll click on the one called Visions, and as you see here, it'll give us the text to the book. We've done classes on Vision 1 and Vision 2. Like we said, we've done this entire book. We've even done a class on Vision 4. And the other parts of the book, Commands and the Similitudes. So after you finish watching this video, I would suggest you go over and check out those playlists or go find that audio book that Stacy was referring to and listen to The Shepherd of Hermes. It'll take you about four hours to listen to the entire book, but I promise you it'll be one of the best, most important books that you'll ever read in your entire life. It starts off a little bit strange because Hermes is having a dream or a vision which is where this portion of the book gets his namesake from. But then as it goes on into to commands and similitudes, it becomes more practical and not so strange, would you say, Stay? Yeah, mm -hmm. not so, um, I guess, strange. You not know? so dreamy. Yeah, I was going to say dream. fairy tale. Yeah, it is a dream that he's having. One of the things that I also want to mention before we get started with the reading is that um, when you do purchase the book, and I would just suggest, and I know, uh, Coach, that you also suggest that they bypass the uh, first writings that goes to tell you about the times of the book. And they will tell you that this book is a folk tale uh, that is not true. So, you know, we want to um, not necessarily take the words of these people who are writing the, the um, what do you call it? The prologue, the, the introduction. In, yeah, the introduction. Yeah, all um, Because, you know, your spirit will witness to you that this book is um, a writing of the Father, so an inspired writing of the Father. So I would just say to bypass that. Yeah, and that's the case with all books, even the books of the Bible. If you go in and listen to or read where the people are given introductions to even the books of the Bible, they will distract you and it almost seems like they're trying to convince you that they are not legitimate and they do that with all of the books including Enoch and Jubilees and Jasher. It's like though a lot of, it's like most of the time those introductions are written by people who don't believe in the scripture at all and their primary focus is to make us discount it as well. So, I agree. Like Stacy said, skip that part. Go back and read it at the end if you want. 
you know, after you have tried it by your spirit for yourself, this is the word of God, and he never expected us to allow people to tell us what we were supposed to think about it. We do have a spirit inside of us that this book and all of the scriptures written for, so we should give our spirit man the opportunity to judge without letting Gentiles or heathen or atheists or scholars or whoever they want to be tell us what they think about it. This book was actually part of our Bibles at one time until some of those Bible scholar kind of people decided that they didn't want it in the Bible and they took it out. They actually removed it. If you go back to the early scriptures, you'll actually find the Shepherd of Hermas in there. In my opinion, the Shepherd of Hermas is the instructions that we were supposed to get in the second era. Of course, the first era, we got those instructions by way of Moses, where we learned the statutes, the judgments, and the commandments back there in Exodus chapter 20 through 23. But if you think about it, could it be possible that the only instructions that we were supposed to get after the Messiah came was the Beatitudes, considering that Matthew would actually be considered an old covenant book because the new covenant didn't start until after the death of the Messiah. We actually didn't get any instructions going forward by way of commandments, statutes, and judgments with the exception of the shepherd of Hermas. And like I said, those guys took it out of our Bibles seemingly maybe to confuse us and keep us to where we were dependent on them for our food, our clothing, our shelter, and even the instructions from our father. After the laws that the father gave to Moses, the next set of laws, if we go strictly by the um, King James Version of the Bible, we haven't been given any new set of laws, you know. No instructions going No forward. instructions, yes. The, um, the Gospels uh, don't give us new instructions. They're, I think they're just um, like talking about the instructions of Moses and things like that, not even the writings of Paul. Um, the Shepherd of Hermas is the book that does give us the laws. And then I would say the next book would be the Third Testament. Yeah, that would be the third era. We got instructions in the third era on how to live spiritually. But the only instructions we got, other than the Beatitudes, you know, that's Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Which point back to the laws of Moses. Yeah, they point back to the same laws that we got from Moses and just expound on them a little bit. Yeah. So you're right. The only instructions that we got as far as commandments and how we're supposed to live in the New Testament era from the birth of Christ to now, or to the Third Testament, was the commands that were given in the book of the Shepherd of Hermits, that second book called Commands. Yeah. So, like we said, we're going to step down through here. We're going to cover all of the verses in this book. There's about 133 verses in this chapter. We won't try to cover them all in this video. So go ahead and subscribe to the channel and hit that bell notification button so you can see when these classes come out, the rest of this series. And if you would, go ahead and hit that like button and be prepared to leave comments as we go. In this first talk part, we're going to talk about Hermas and this lady that we'll find out later as the church. But in the following parts of this class, we'll get into the actual building of the church. And, of course, what it's talking about is the building of the people who makes up the kingdom of heaven. That tower-shaped temple we know as the third temple. You may remember the verse over in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 where it says, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and only priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Jesus Christ. The stones that he's talking about is no doubt pointing to what we'll learn over here in the Shepherd of Hermas because we find out that that tower shaped temple is built of the stones that are our spirit man that you read about all in the 
second chapter of first Peter. But we'll talk about that more as we get into that portion of the book. And then toward the end of the book, there's a special message for the elect of God from the church. From our father, we find a message that he sent to us by way of the scripture by directly that we as the ministers of Christ are supposed to go out and teach the elect of God. And again, that's who this book is written for, is for the elect of the Most High. Not necessarily for the entire church body who would consist of Gentiles and non-believers. This book is primarily for the elect, the chosen, the 144,000, those who plan to inherit the earth and go on to be the new Noahs of the world. All right, Stacy, do you mind reading? I will be the reader. All right, if you would, start Vision 1, which is on the building of the church triumphant and several sorts of rapabates. First one, the vision which I saw, brethren, was this. Okay, so now again, this is a vision. This is a dream, what we would call a dream. Mm -hmm. and Like this, a daydream. Yeah, like a daydream. In the third book called Similitudes and Similitudes 9, we're going to hear the exact same story, but it's not going to be in a dream state like it is in this state or a night or a daydream state. It's going to be um, more more vivid than this one is. But this one um, is going to be able to give enough information for us to understand what's going on. And like we said, our plans is to expound on each of these verses that we're going to talk about and you know tell you as much as we know about them mm -hmm. so we'll be jumping our head and jumping around and jumping all over the place as we add details that you wouldn't necessarily catch in the verse if you just read vision three alone right number two when i had often fasted and prayed unto the lord that he would manifest unto me the revelation which he had promised by the old woman to show unto me. The same night she appeared unto me and said unto me. So here it is. He's talking about the same night. So is this a daydream? It could be a night dream. Right. Mm -hmm. But notice. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, yes, it is possible to have visions as night as well. But he is talking about how he has fasted and prayed. Yeah, so I believe in this verse because we know that the acceptable fast for the Father is that we um, go out and I'm going to sum it up by say work merits. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a fast of um, abstaining from uh, food as well. Yeah. And I believe that is the fast that Hermes is talking about in this verse. Yeah, and I, and I believe you're right too because we learn later on that Hermes is going to be instructed on a proper fast. Right. The fast that you read about in Isaiah chapter 58. And so, yeah, uh, in this one, Hermes is, is abstaining from food. But you have to understand that the, what that does for you as far as abstaining from food, that that kind of fast actually sharpens your mind. I think it humbles, um, I guess I want to say humble the flesh. Yeah. To... Um, open you up to be um, ready to receive things from the Father. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. Whereas the Isaiah chapter 58 kind of fast humbles your spirit. Oh, right. That's, yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Now notice it says that he would manifest unto me the revelation which he had promised by the old lady to show unto me. So, you know, there's a lot of information in there talking about this old lady. This old lady is the church. Yes. Who was created even before Adam and Eve was created, even before the earth was created. And what we read in the previous two chapters is how he had been communicating with this lady and she promised to give him this huge vision. And it is just now that Hermes is about to actually get this vision in this part of the book, in this in this chapter. Yeah, one of the things that make that stand out to me is when he says when I had often fasted and prayed unto the Lord that he would manifest, showing unto me revelations. And, you know, it just reminds me how when I was in the church, how we would always uh, go on a fast 
and pray when we really wanted something. Mm -hmm. um, how, you know, we would dedicate that time to often, you know, fasting, praying, uh, going throughout the day, you would have a 12 o'clock prayer, you would stop at 2 o'clock and pray, you know, 6 o'clock, and, you know, we should be doing these things at all times, mm -hmm. not just when we want something from the Father, we should be setting aside time to communicate with Him um, throughout the day. Yeah, and I, I, now that I think about it, you know, that type of fasting could be a way of gaining merits, you know, putting you in that hunger, mm -hmm. uncomfortable position, um, would be a way of gaining merits, and yeah, you would get uh, benefits from that humbling process, even spiritual benefits from torturing or afflicting your body in that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, let's read verse 3. Because thou doest thus afflict thyself, and art so desirous to know all things, come into the field where thou wilt, and about the sixth hour. I will appear unto thee and show thee what thou must see. This is what we were just talking about, how this affliction of his body is benefiting him. Mm -hmm. And because he is doing this, um, she's about to come and meet with him out in the field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that part is important to understand because we learn in this scripture and even in the third testament of the Bible that this field environment, this natural environment is important when we want to um, hear from the Father um, intuitively, when we want to spend time with the Father, we want to, or we actually have to, we need to get away from all forms of technology, even our houses and our cars, and actually get out there in a natural environment. And so that's what she's telling Hermes to do here. What is the significance, do you believe? I'm seeing that in, chapter, in verse 2 where she appeared to the, him at night, what is the significance, or is there one of the sixth hour? What, what time is that in today's time? The first hour starts right at dawn, at a, what we would consider somewhere around six o'clock in the day. And so the sixth hour would be about 12 noon for us. Okay. But even though he's saying at night? Well, Remember that in verse 2, she's talking to him at night, but in verse 3, she's telling him that she's going to meet him tomorrow. Right. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, she's saying that in verse 2, she's telling him that uh, she appeared unto him, but then she's saying the next day I will meet you mm -hmm. at uh in the, the sixth, field. Yeah, in the sixth hour. Now, I think yes. the significance of that is, of course, he was would have been sleeping in his bed and in his house mm -hmm. amongst all of his material possessions and stuff. Mm -hmm. Even maybe his wife and his kids. Right. But now she's wanting to expound this vision to him, but he's, she's going to need him to be in a natural environment. She's going to need for him to be out there amongst the that natural temple. Yeah, mm-hmm. Where, you know, he won't be so distracted. Yeah. And, you know, we are instructed, like I said, in the Third Testament to do that. Anytime right. we, you know, it tells us if we ever have a question um, that we should go to a natural environment and, you know, meditate on that question. Yeah, away from the distraction. And I would say when you um, go into nature, you're closer with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Definitely, yes. definitely, because, you know, you think about you in your house, you're around all man-made stuff, but when you get out in the nature, everything in nature is a part of his creation. You can see him in everything out there, mm -hmm. from the gnat to the tree to the star, everything. When you're looking at the even the dirt on the ground, yes. you're looking at a part of, you know, who he is. So she appears to him, and now they're about to have a conversation where she explains the vision. Right. Mm -hmm. And that'll be a few verses on down, but yeah, she's going to lead up to it here in this section. Number four. Yep. I asked her saying, lady, in what part of the field? She answered, wherever thou wilt, only choose a good and a private place. And before I began to speak and tell her the place, she said unto me, I will come where thou wilt. Yeah, because you understand that 
she is a spiritual being. So it's not necessary for Hermes to say exactly where he's going to be at. She knows where he's going to be at, right. wherever he decides to go. Mm -hmm. And so that's what it's, that's why she cut him off. It doesn't matter. Wherever you choose. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And once again, it reiterates um, going to a, choosing a good and private place. Yeah, I, I have a, a place that I like to go when, you know, I need to spend time with the father and, you know, sometimes I'll take it an old bucket out there to sit on. Mm -hmm. But other than that, that's the only man-made thing that I can actually see. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, I'm not looking down at my shoes or anything, but everything else around me is a natural environment. Yeah, I have a place that... Um I go to as well where I've you know I feel close to the father I've cried to him there I've um, somewhat fussed at him there and you know told him how I didn't understand his ways and it's just a place where you can feel his presence and you know if you tarry there long enough I would say you will receive an answer yeah you got to, and that's important too you got to stay, stay there long enough you can't get out there and you know, telling me, you know, I got five minutes, let me have it. No, it, it may take longer than five minutes. Yeah. Number five. I was therefore, brethren, in the field, and I observed the hours and came into the place where I had appointed her to come. Yeah. So, you know, Hermiston shows out this quiet place. You know, everybody, anybody who has this place, like you were talking about, you have your own place. That would have been a place that you would have went. And so now he's watched the hours go by, and he knows it's now the sixth hour. Six. And I beheld a bench placed. It was a linen pillow, and over it spread a covering of fine linen. Okay, now this is important to the study, is how there's actually a bench there. Now, I would like to see, you know, the original language that this was written in to maybe get a better idea of what kind of chair or seat this actually is mm -hmm. because it's going to play an important part in the story we'll see later on towards the end of this chapter. Yeah. In this one, she's going to be in a bench, and the next one, she's going to be in a chair, and the next one, she's going to be, you know, I can't remember if it's a stool or standing up or something like that, but where she sit, where they, where they are actually sitting at is important. Mm -hmm. Seven. When I saw these things ordered in this manner, and that there was nobody in the place, I began to be astonished, and my hair stood on end, and a kind of horror seized me, for I was alone. Yeah. So you know, he didn't took her. He didn't came to his own private place. He didn't even tell her where this place was at. Right. And so he didn't show it up to this place that he didn't probably been to, you know, a dozen times before. And all of a sudden, there's this chair there with this linen pillow on top spread with a covering of fine linen. Right. You know, and, you know, I looked this up. I used to think linen was white. Linen is actually a tan color. Yeah, it's a natural. Natural color, like mm -hmm. a light brown or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, I tried to find a picture, and I may even have to order me some linen so I can create this, so I can make my, my own picture of this bench with this linen pillow and this linen covering on it. Yeah, I actually looked it up the other day, and there are several places um, where you can find um, decent, like, remnants. And yeah. different, you know, decent size for a decent uh, price. Yeah, just something so we could see, get an idea of what this could actually look like. Number eight. Well, do we do we have anything else on seven? Well, we want to talk about how you know when he noticed that these um, this bench and these the covering was sitting in his private spot where apparently nobody knew about that he had chose out. Uh, when he sit saw it sitting there, of course he was. Kind of scared, you know. Yeah. What's going on? How yeah. did that get How did there? This get here, you know, yeah. you can imagine if it was us, it would be on our property. Mm -hmm. So it's like, who would have put this here? You yeah. know, what I mean? where mm -hmm. did, you know, how did this appear on my property? Don't nobody even know where this place is at. Yeah, you know, and so yeah, it would have been kind of, kind of, yeah, of, scared. Yeah. I, I would, I would have saw it and uh, ran. <laughs> You came back and said, well, uh, yeah, somebody's down there. They're going to set up something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Number eight. But being come to myself and calling to mind the glory of God, 
and taking courage, I fell down upon my knees and began to confess my sins as before. So, you know, his spirit kind of helped him out there, gave him a sense of bravery and made yeah. him not run on. You can imagine how bad it would have been for the rest of us is if he had never gotten this vision. Right. You know, so praise the Lord, he had a little bit of courage. And um, you want to talk about why, how he fell down on his knees and began to confess his sins? Go ahead. As before? Yeah. Well, he seems to always be doing this. Yeah. And, you know, I know in Scripture it does tell us to confess our sins. Mm -hmm. um, talk about why, why, why are we encouraged to confess our sins? Confessing our sins makes it known to yourself, our Father, and, you know, the entire universe that you are aware of what you have done wrong. I always relate it to, like, the child who has done something in error and done something wrong. You know, if, you know, that when the child comes up to you and says, Mama, um, I'm sorry to say I broke your widget. You know, you're less likely to come now hard on that child than if you were to have to go find it yourself. And if the child were to lie about it and say, you know, I didn't do that. When you confess your sin, you make it known that you understand that you have done wrong. And that goes a long way with our father because, you know, the, the punishment doesn't have to be so severe as if he got approved to you. You know, like I tell my, my kids all the time, you know, I don't really have to convince you that you did wrong. That's what the belt is for. The yeah. belt will convince you that you did wrong. But then when that child comes in and lets me know, um, yeah, I know I did this wrong. I know I did that wrong. Then I don't have to be so severe on them. A lot of times, you know, the punishment is in the crime itself. Yeah, and that just reminds me of how um, at one time I... Um was notorious for um, banging up our vehicles. <laughs> yeah, you like yeah. wrecked two vehicles in one day. <laughs> yeah, and I would, like, if if I got a, a ding on one of the vehicle doors and I would try to cover it up or I would position the, the car so that, you know, nobody could <laughs> see it or whatever like that. And, you know, when you did find out, maybe three or four days, a week later, you would sort of give me a little you know, lashing, you know, why you didn't tell me, you know, we could have got this fixed or dotted out of this. But, you know, when I did tell you, come, you know, as soon as you would arrive home, I was like, hey, you know, I got a dinger on the vehicle again. You know, you would be like, okay, you know, we'll get it fixed, you yeah. know. But once you started, you start trying to hide your sins, yeah. um, things seem to, uh, the situation seems to get a lot worse. Yeah, yeah so important, confessing our sins, you know, to our Father. It don't necessarily mean that you have to confess confess the sins to the pastor or the preacher or anything. I don't know that that's necessary, but, you know, and that's not what Hermes is doing here. Hermes is on his knees, and he's confessing his sins to, you know, to our Father, you know. And that's a big part of, you know, what we are going through and what we are about to go through is repentance, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, you know, a big portion of this book called The Shepherd of Hermes is learning the importance of repentance, in it, you know, and what it looks like. And confession of the sin goes a long way as far as your repentance because, you know, you're identifying what it is that you did wrong. And then, you know, you just, you know, once you know, you know, knowing it's half the battle, now you can start to think about correcting. Yeah. Number nine. And while I was doing this, the old woman came thither with the six young men whom I had seen before and stood behind me as I was praying and heard me praying and confessing my sins unto the Lord. So you have the six young men here. These are angels. Yeah. We, we're going to learn later on that, that these are um, the top angels. This would be the archangels. This would be uh, the Michaels. This would be Gabriel. This would be Raphael. This would be... Mm -hmm. um, even, maybe even Uriel, mm -hmm. who we're going to you know, hear about a lot in this book. Um, we're going to hear from Uriel. Um, these are the, the top venerable angels. Um, and, you know, here for her to be with them um, is important to the story because we're going to see them later on and how they, you know, are in charge of building this tower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And touching me, she said... Leave off to pray now only for thy sins. Pray also for righteousness, 
that thou may receive a part of her in thy house. Yeah, so Hermas is confessing his sins, um, but she's saying, don't only just confess your sins, but pray to actually get better. Pray yeah. to, you know, stop sinning. Yeah, to become righteous, and not only for yourself, but for your household as well. For your entire household. Now, Hermas is a pious individual. Like he says, he's constantly praying in this book. You know, that's why he was chosen to um, deliver this message, is because he was a very prayerful, very pious um, individual. But you have to remember that Hermas would have only had the uh, instructions from Moses to go by. He would not have even had the Beatitudes because the uh, books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John weren't available yet. Mm -hmm. And so he may underst have understood the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, but he hasn't gained what he will gain in the second book called Commands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, he hasn't gotten that second era instruction. Yeah, one of the things, you know, as you said, that Hermas was pious, I also thought about how he had to have been um, an humble individual. Yeah. And it makes me think of how earlier we were talking about, you know, during the time of Moses, we were talking about, you now the shepherd of Hermas, as well as the Third Testament, where the father was giving instructions. We know that Moses was a humble individual. Yeah. And, you know, we also know that Ro Roaches was a humble individual. Yeah. So that leads me to believe that the Father works through people who are humble. Yeah. You know, the Third Testament encourages us to, that we have to be humble. And um, by looking at that example of how he used these three individuals when giving out the laws and in the instructions, um, it makes us makes me think that, you know, you have to be humble. Yeah. Well, you think about it, the Messiah was the most humble person on right. the planet. Yes, you know yes, what I mean? Messiah because, as well. You know, he went through a whole lot of stuff that, you know, the rest of us would have turned around and brought down fire and, you know, mm -hmm. lightning on somebody's head. And, you know, he just sat there and took that, you know, that's a that's a huge part of, of humility. But you're right, you know, it's it's absolutely necessary for us to have humility in this time. I was just thinking about it the other day that, you know, if we are arrogant, the father can't help. He can't help us. He cannot help us if we're arrogant. Because we know it, we think we know it all. Already. Right. Right. We can't be touched. You know, if we are arrogant, he can't get through to us to convince us to, you know, correct our ways and of course every one of us you know needs correction mm -hmm. we all have missing parts to this puzzle even the smartest of us doesn't have a full understanding of what's going on and so when somebody comes to you and says you know I have a bit of information you know if you if we're too arrogant then we can't accept that that uh, bit of information and we'll go on in error. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll go on in mistruths. We'll go on in lies or whatever, making mistakes because we're too arrogant to actually let somebody give us their portion of the truth that the Father has shared with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll shut them down mm -hmm. um, and say or even believe that they don't have anything to add or to tell you that is new that you already know. And Everybody has something to add. Yeah, definitely. Everybody has something to add. You know, you're right about that. And, you know, I can't stress that enough. That's one of the most important things that we learn from the Shepherd of Hermes is we have to be humble. You have to be humble. If you don't, you're going to get humiliated. You're going, you're going, you're going, it's, it says that, you know, in the scripture in the Third Testament, that when you are, when you become arrogant, you will start to destroy everything that you have created. Everything that you've worked so hard for up until that point. The moment you become arrogant about it, that's the moment you start going backwards and start destroying stuff and start tearing up stuff. The arrogant person will destroy his whole, er, whole world mm -hmm. until the moment he decides that he's going to be humble. Until mm -hmm. the second that he decides he's going to be humble, he's going to be destroying himself. His yeah. family, his home, his ministry, his job, everything, he's going to destroy it. Number 11. And she lifted me up from the place and took me by the hand and brought me to the seat and said to the young men, go and build. Okay, so now here it is that she's telling these young men, we, we find out that they're angels. They're actually in charge of the building of this temple that we're going to hear about. Again, this... this um, um, the large portion of this book is about 
the uh, building of the third temple. Yes. And, you know, she's telling these angels to go here and build. Now, we're not going to get into the building of this tower in this section. We're going to stop on about verse 20 or so. But, you know, here, even in this chapter, we're going to see the building process of, of the six individuals and how they are using us to build the third temple. The third temple will be built on us. Again, I refer you back over to Second Peter or First Peter, chapter two. Number 12, as soon as they were departed and we were alone, she said unto me, sit here. I answered her, lady, let those who are elders sit first. She replied, sit down as I bid you. Yeah. So now this is, you know, kind of on a spiritual thing. If we were, if it was humans and this was a real old lady, yeah, his chivalry would be in place. But, you know, this is talking about the church here. You know, right. you sit down. You know what I mean? You mm -hmm. sit down first. You are the weak one here. You know, mm -hmm. we are ange we are angels. You know, we are the church. Yeah. You know, so, you know, follow what you're told. You sit down. Yeah. 13. And when I have sat at the right side, she suffered me not, but made a sign to me with her hand that I should sit on the left. Now, this is important. All the way through scripture, we hear about those on the right side and those on the left side. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of the military. If you remember in our military formation, the most superior person in our squad was always on the right side. You know, the rest of us had to stand to his left. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I believe that even has something to do with, you know, the way we the way our cars are set up here in America, where, you know, the superior individual is not really the one driving the vehicle. And that's why he sits on the right side of the car. But anyway, that's just on my own thoughts. But what we're going to find here. And, you know, like we heard about over there in the Messiah, when he was talking, how he said that he would be on the right hand of the father. Yeah. Um, there's really significance in being on the right side or the left side when it comes to spiritual stuff. Yeah. You think of, um, I guess the right side is being the more dominant side. I don't know. The left side. Um, I don't know. Is well, less dominant. Well, in the military, the idea was is that okay, the most superior uh, person in the squad was actually the stronger fighter, and they fought with swords. So, and most people are right-handed, so he would have his right hand available for the battle, right? Mm -hmm. If he was on the other side, he would be. Um, little a little bit hindered because he would have some of his own soldiers to the to his right and he may possibly you know injure them but if you put him on the far right now he has a full swing when it comes to going into battle so yeah this the right side will be for the more superior warrior or the better warrior or an elevated state but she's going to go on to explain here okay why you know the difference between the right side and the left side Okay. Number 14. As I was therefore amusing and full of sorrow that she would not suffer me to sit on the right side, she said unto me, Hermas, why art thou sad? And this reminds me of the book of Proverbs, you know, when it says, you know, don't put yourself in an elevated position. Always wait for somebody to call you up to the table, you right. know, because if you do, you know, go up to the elevated position this is what's going to happen to you. Yeah. Just what happened here, here to Hermes when he tried to put himself in an elevated position. She sat him down. No, you go back over there. Step yeah, down. You're you know not I mean? ready to sit up here. Yeah, yet. You, you ain't supposed to be here. You're in yeah. the wrong place. Mm -hmm. You know, so Hermes, he hasn't read Proverbs too much. <laughs> Number 15. The place which is on the right is theirs who have already attained unto God and have suffered for his name's sake. But there is yet a great deal remaining unto thee before thou can sit with them. So Hermes ain't been through nothing. Right. You ain't been through nothing, Hermes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Your biggest thing that you've been through is you was a slave at one point. And, you got you know, a talkative wife and got, bad yeah, kids. <laughs> yeah, you got lewd kids and talkative wife. But, mm -hmm. I, but you ain't really, you know, you haven't suffered persecutions. You haven't, you know, 
you, you haven't gone through anything yet. Yeah. Those people who have been beheaded, those people who have gone through these struggles, they're in an elevated position is what she's telling Hermes here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 16. But continue as thou doest in thy sincerity, and thou shalt sit with them, as all others shall that do their works, and shall bear what they have borne. Okay, so he's telling, you know, continue to learn what you're about to learn here, and those struggles will come upon you one day, as it will for all of us, yeah. you know, and then you'll be able to sit on the right side. Most of us now, and today, you know, this is, you know, right here at the end of the year 2020, we ain't really been through much at all. No. You mm -mm. know, but, you know, we do have this tribulation, this apocalypse to go through, and, you know, those of us who survive, um, this tribulation, um, will 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 be able to sit on the right side. Yeah, a lot of times we think that we've been through uh, things, you know, and you know, my struggles are not your struggles, and you know, but we really, when we take a look at some of the things that other people are going through for the sake of His name, uh, we really haven't been through anything. You know, we got people yeah. in other countries who are being martyred. Who are being starved to death who are you know just a lot of things that's going on and we have the freedom of not going through those things and you know there's a lot of things people are going through for the sake of the father's names yeah. that we don't know about so yeah there's a lot of people in hunger right now yeah. in poverty right now you know what i mean that you know yeah there's a lot of people going through a lot of stuff for this struggle and the only thing about it those are the early birds those are the forerunners. Those are the people who are set aside to lead the rest of us. Because all of us getting ready to go through it. And we'll, we'll feel ourselves blessed when we have those who, you know, are around that can say, Hey, don't worry, you're going to survive. Yeah. Hey, you know, you you're not going to starve it. to death. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It, you, sure, you're barely hurting, but you know what I'm saying? You go over there and eat that plant right there. It's edible. Eat that. You know what I'm saying? We'll have those who went before us that can help us out. Because, like I said, all of us got to go. All of us, all, you know, I've been homeless one day. Mm -hmm. I've been home. At, I, I was homeless at one point, you know. And so, you know, there was one individual that sent me an email saying, you know, that his parents was about to, you know, put him out of the house and he was thinking about going to sleep in a car. And I'm like, hey, that's great, man, because, you know, a lot of people ain't got their car to sleep in. You right. know, they right under the stars, you know. Yeah. I want them to tell them, you know, that, you know, being homeless is not that bad, you know what I mean? Jump on it. But, you know. Especially uh, when you're a single individual. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're not accountable to a wife or children. Um, it's really tough then. Yeah. When you got babies crying, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. Right. Um, so, yeah. you know, we, we, we really need to understand that, stop being so selfish and look at, you know, this world from our own eyes and look at it from the other guys because, like you said, there's a lot of people going through a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Number 17. I said to her, lady, I would know what it is that they have suffered. Here then said she, wild beasts, scourging, imprisonments, and crosses for his name's sake. Yeah, so these are some of the things that these people have gone through. Wild beasts, you have to remember that one of the things that the Romans did to the Hebrews after 70 AD when they had them captured was they made sport of them. You know, in those Roman cathedrals over there, one of the things they did was they brought these Hebrews in, these Hebrew men in, and allowed the lions to eat them in front of everybody else. They just threw them in a ring with a lion, and the whole uh, sport about it was how long is he going to run around before this lion or this tiger catches him and chews him up and eats him right there in front of us. Yeah, imprisonments as well as crosses. I think we have to remember also that this was happening right around the time, right after the Messiah, yeah. um, during the time of Peter, Paul, and um, the um, disciples of the Messiah. So they were under uh, the rulership of Rome, and they didn't show any mercy toward no, you know, they really the didn't people care. of God. Yeah. And, you know, when it talks about crosses there, it's not only talking about that wooden cross that we can see and being hung. It's talking about, you know, um, 
It's talking about being humble. It's talking about being persecuted. It's talking about, you know, um, anytime anybody, you know, does anything to you, you know, calling you a liar or calling you a false prophet or right. anything like that. Those are those are the crosses that we are bear. Talking to wife right. or even smashing your finger are all part of these crosses that he's talking about here. Right. 18. For this cause, the right hand of holiness belongs to them and to all others, as many as shall suffer for the name of God. But the left belongs to the rest. Yeah. So, you know, those of us who are willing to suffer and do have to go through some suffer, we will be in the most elevated position. You know, you know, I know you hate to hear this kind of stuff, but the most important position out of anybody who goes through the tribulation will be the one who is actually killed for the name of God. Yeah. Yeah, we'll find out in similitudes, um, and when it's talking about those mountains, um, one of the, you know, of course, you know, innocence goes a long way too, but um, like the Messiah was martyred, you know, he was killed, that put him in the highest position out of everything that, you know, is to actually have to die for the word of God. Mm -hmm. It also um, makes me think also about how um, we as human beings always want to be happy. Yeah, and comfortable. You know, yeah, and comfortable and, you know, Lord, just let me be happy. I just want to be happy. You know, and I've said this too. I've said this many of times. But when you're happy, you're, you're not being, you're not benefiting anybody you know yeah. what i'm saying you're, you're benefiting just yourself but when you have to go through things then not only do you have a testimony but you can help people and so just being happy you know though we want it and though i want it too um it doesn't help you in your striving for the kingdom if that if that makes sense Yes, it does. And in fact, it reminded me of, you know, what we read over in the Beatitudes, um, how it starts off and it's talking about what it means to be blessed. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, mm -hmm. blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek or the humble. It says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. And, you know, some of these, if you look at other translations, it says, blessed are those that are hungry. Mm -hmm. You know, blessed yeah. are those that are that are that are uh, uh, thirsty, you know, because it says those who are hungry now will be fed later. Yeah. You know, so and that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, how there's some people who are out here going through a lot of stuff. You know, the father is preparing them for, you know, what's to come. And they are, while they're out there now and they're being hungry. They're learning how to live without. They're learning how to not rely on the grocery store so much for their food. You know, mm -hmm. you know. I think when we was going through our hunger pains, we we found about you know five or six different plants that was growing in our yard that you know we had been mowing down with a lawnmower that turned out to be food. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. you know that you know it's just growing in the wild. All of this works to our benefit. Anything that's you know seems to be harming us actually is working to our benefit. So in 18, he's essentially saying, well, she's essentially saying that the ones who are on the right are those who have went through something and the ones on the left are those who uh, just want to be happy or just live the comfortable life. Or haven't gone through it yet. Yeah, yeah. have not yeah, gone through yeah. it yet. Mm -hmm. 19, how be it the gifts and the promises belong to both, to them on the right and to those on the left hand? Only that sitting on the right hand, they have some glory above the others. Yeah, so it's like a purple heart. Yeah. You know? How's the, wait, what do you mean? Well, you know, you don't get anything okay. extra benefit in the yeah. military for being wounded as a soldier. Right. You just got that distinction yeah. that you get to have a purple heart. Right. You know, you don't get no promotion out of it. You don't get no extra money out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't, you know, it's just that, you know, you there is that distinction. Yeah, it's just saying like, yeah, that's, that's a good example. Um. She's saying, you know, both the gifts are for both, mm -hmm. but it's just that those that on the right are going to be above those that are on the left. You're still going to get the gift, but I don't know if I would even say above. It's just, you know, okay, 
Yeah, have some glory. They said it says have some glory above the others. Yeah, so yeah, so have yeah. some glory above the others. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you're right. They so they just have a little bit more glory. Yeah. And that they can say, you know, I was beheaded for the name of God. Yeah. You know, you know, or I had to suffer this persecution, or I had to suffer that persecution. Right. You know, for for this ministry or whatever it is that we're going through. Yeah, not not anything arrogant because we know you know those. We're not talking about that, but just it's just the fact that those who have been through something will get more glory than those who have not. Yet and still, those who have not will receive gifts as well. We'll see the same promises. Yeah. Twenty. But thou art desirous to sit on the right hand with them, and yet thy defects are many. But thou shalt be purged from thy defects, as also all who doubt not shall be cleansed from all the sins which they have committed until this day. Yeah, so this is what we're going to learn in the Shepherd of Hermes, is how our sins will be put away, how those misdeeds will be done away with. It's going to go into detail about charitable deeds. It's going to go into detail about uh, uh, repentance. But then it's going to go and talk about um, these passions that control man and mm -hmm. how it's necessary to put those things away. This, like I said at the beginning of this video, this is probably one of the most important books that you'll ever read if you're planning on inheriting the earth. If you plan on being here, this doctrine is absolutely necessary for our survival. Those who don't get these principles and put away things like hatred and selfishness and anger and lying, they're going to be tormented in the tribulation and they're going to end up killing each other and they're going to end up dying. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, they're going to be, you know, it's going to talk about um, later on how, you know, they will end up in a inferior place when it's talking about the tower. It's going to talk about how, you know, those people who don't um, work to cleanse their spirit will be set in an inferior place. What it's talking about is you're going to be the chaps in the kingdom of heaven. That's what it's talking about. You're going to be, you know, you're going to be somebody's chap. You're going to be my grandkid, and I'm going to spank your butt. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're arrogant now, but like I said, that belt, that, 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 that that belt. belt will convince you of the error of your ways. Yeah, and that's just like uh, life in general. When you start going through something, you're able to see, see it from a different point of view. And trouble and trials, they will change your mind mm -hmm. about this a situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And lastly, verse 21. And when she had said this, she would have departed. Yeah, she was ready to go, you know, and, you know, her, she didn't basically broke this down to Hermes. And she didn't told Hermes everything she needed to know. But Hermes is like us. He's human. And he's like, ah, wait, wait, wait. You're going to have to talk some more on this. Yeah. You're going to have to break this down for me. I don't believe you gave me everything I need. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so he's going to call her back. And she's actually going to start telling him about this tower shaped temple and how it is to be built. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and we're going to pick that up in the next class and we're going to expound on it. But in the meantime, guys, like we said, go in, find the book called The Shepherd of Hermes. You can look on uh, YouTube and for the book called The Shepherd of Hermes, you can look for um, a video that's about four hours and 20 minutes long or something like that. You can listen to the entire book. Um, you can get this PDF that we showed you here on um, um, eenglishwikisource.org or you can go order the book. I would suggest you order the book because this is one you'll want to read over and over. And then again you want to have your own arsenal of hard copy books. Yeah. It's great to have a PDF or um, an audio but we never know in the days that we live in um, how long this internet is going to stay yeah. up if we're going to if we're going to have computers or whatever and it's always good to just have that uh, that book in your hand yeah because like you say you're going to want to read it you know multiple times since about 1998 1997 um you know ain't no telling how many times i've actually read this book and then if you count just listening to the audio i bet it's almost a hundred times 
Yeah, we 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 enjoy this book a lot. Yeah, and, and you know we learn from it a lot. Also. Learn from it a lot. You enjoy it. It's a, it's a great book. Um, so you guys check out that video. Check out the um, playlist that we've done on this. You know, same way we've done this class, verse by verse. We've covered every other chapter in the Shepherd of Hermes. This is our last chapter, and we will have finished the entire book. Yep. Mm hmm. And if you haven't done so already, make sure that you hit that subscription button and that bell notification button so you can see when these new classes come out. Please leave us a comment, add your input to the discussion, and hit that like button. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom.